I wanted to use my Tamron 150 to 600 millimeter lens and see how it worked photographing wildlife. I'm not an expert at taking pictures of wild animals, so I called my father and I asked him to give me a list of tips on photographing wild animals. My father shot for National Geographic for Audubon, all the wildlife magazines for years. He photographed bighorn sheep out in the wild. So I called him up and asked him to give me information, the things that I need to know before I go out and photograph animals. So here is tips and how I apply them. Number one, go to the national parks and state parks. There are wild animals living in close proximity of people so much that they get much tamer than out in the wild and you can get a lot closer to them. It's a lot easier to photograph them. So that's exactly what I did. I headed to Yellowstone National Park. I wanted to photograph buffalo. I went to the ranger station. I said, where are the buffalo at in the park right now? And they were very helpful. You'll see them over in Hayden Valley. You're going to see them over on the summit. There's going to be some down by these geysers. So that gave us our first direction on where to find the buffalo. And we knew we were going to be able to get fairly close to them because we're in a national park. Number two, use a tripod. He said the very first time he shot images and sent them into National Geographic, they sent all his images back and said, send us more images as soon as you buy a tripod. And that was his first introduction to taking pictures of bighorn sheep. So I used a tripod. Now, as I applied this, I wanted to shoot some video and some stills. So I put a video head on the tripod. With that 150 to 600 millimeter Tamron lens, it's got a collar that allows you to move the camera from vertical to horizontal. So it really gives me the vertical horizontal uh, movement of a still tripod on the lens, but then I've got the video motion and movement for the, the tripod head. I found it was a little slow compared to using a still tri camera tripod, but I used it and I got some great video as well as stills, and it was kind of the way we went after it. But you've got to use a tripod. Number three, telephoto lens are a necessity. I mean, that's why this 150 to 600 millimeter lens is just perfect, because you've got to be able to get close enough to the animals and get uh, fill the frame, and you really need a long lens to make that happen. Now, my dad does give this advice. He said, the, the most neglected lens in wildlife photography is a wide-angle lens. He said, that's because most people don't spend enough time for the animals to get comfortable enough with them that they can get close enough that you can get great close-up images of wildlife with wide-angle lenses. And I've seen that he's done that, and it's pretty amazing because you get these huge vistas with these animals in the foreground very close to you and those are very cool but that takes a lot of talent and a lot of time number four shoot early in the morning and late in the day now this is common sense for people but you know what you're in yellowstone and you're on vacation you want to take a picture of a deer or a buffalo and what do you do you sleep till 10. it just doesn't work we got up at 5 a.m we headed out from the place we were staying got in the car and we were there as the sun was coming up as we got the geysers and the buffalo my father's advice is very right on. You've got to be out there when the animals are moving around. That's usually early in the morning or late in the day. Number five, good wildlife photography requires a lot of time. A lot of time spent with the animals because they learn to be comfortable around you and then you learn to be comfortable around them. I had this happen to me exactly. I started walking and photographing and heard a buffalo. They crossed a mountain. I just kept walking with them. Pretty soon, they were unaware that I was even there. I was just kind of photographing, and I realized as I was photographing them that the herd had enveloped me and had gone around me, and so I had buffalo on all sides. Was it smart? It just happened. It wasn't an intent. But the animals became comfortable enough because I was there, I was non-threatening. Most people jump from the car, try to grab a shot, and then run. But you need to have, spend time so that the animals get more comfortable with you. With different wildlife, this can be applied differently, but for the buffalo herd, I just kind of became a part of the herd as I walked along with them. And I've seen my father do that as he became a part of the bighorn sheep herd that he shot with. He said that as the herd would leave and move, he said they would get to the horizon and they would stop and they would look back and they would wait for him to gather his equipment and to come along with them because he was a part of the herd and they would wait for him to get up with them before they would move on out of, out of his sight. Number six, don't hide away in the hotel when it's raining and it's, there's thunder and there's snow. Some of the best lighting situations come in extreme weather. So get out there when there's wind blowing and there's dust and there's snow and there's rain. That is a great time to shoot. So get your equipment weatherized and get out there and be ready to photograph. You know, I got up early one morning and I was driving off to where the buffalo were and I could see this great big male buffalo way across this grass and there he sat completely covered in frost. And I'm thinking to myself, do I want to walk? I mean, it was a long ways out there, crossed all that wet and muck in the morning and I didn't do it. And to this day, I just so angry at myself because 
there was a great shot of that buffalo laying down. He completely covered with frost in the frost covered grass. I should have made myself do it. So number seven, my father really emphasizes social interactions. Photograph animals doing the things that we find interesting as people. Mothering, the young playing, fighting, mating, grooming, affection, you know, jockeying for dominance, yeah, chasing tourists. That's when he sent those. I thought it was kind of funny. <laughs> that is a good one. Just get in there and look for opportunities. And I saw that when I was photographing the herd, the, uh, the young calves that were nursing, the mother with the young calves. Those became very interesting photographs to do as you saw them together. And so it's really an important thing to look for that social interactions that people will relate to. Number eight is my favorite. My dad had taught me this from a very young age and I've seen him apply it many, many times. He said, use the lost wallet technique. He said, never go charging after an animal with your camera. You look like you've lost your wallet and you walk around looking at the ground in kind of a zigzag pattern, looking for your wallet and you completely ignore the animals. Pretty soon they lost interest in what you're doing because they think you're looking for your wallet and you just kind of work up on them slowly and as you get there, you kind of settle in and start taking some pictures. And I used that the morning I was in the valley that I had one buffalo there and I just kind of wandered around and was looking for my wallet and I would sit up and take some pictures and wander a little more and, and pretty soon he didn't care if I was there or not. So the lost wallet technique kind of ends the tips that my dad gave me, although he said there's a lot more he could give and add. But I'm going to give you three that I learned when I was out there shooting. So number nine is I set my motor drive on continuous. I wanted to shoot three to nine frames every time I shot a picture. That way if a bird took off, the first one may be great, but the, the sequential images after that are going to be far better. So use that motor drive. Have it on continuous. Every time you hit, you're doing bursts of frames. You're not doing a single frame. Number 10 was, I shot at 250 of the second or faster the whole weekend because I wanted to freeze the action and if that buffalo charged, I can get a couple of shots while I'm running so I don't get killed. I can make it a really shallow depth of field. I can make it a really deep depth of field. That 150 to 600 millimeter lens does have a variable aperture, which makes it a little more difficult because you can't change your shutter speed if you're trying to keep it 250 to the second, so you've got to change your ISO. So number 11, have a backpack set up in the car with all the equipment in it and ready to go. So when you jump out of the car and run, you've got everything with you. Have it all there. Have extra batteries and cards and a lens so that if you see an animal, you just grab that, jump out of the car, grab your tripod and go. I had the experience where I was shooting. I was shooting. I didn't have anything with me. Uh, my battery was getting a little low. And uh, Jolene from the car started waving her arms. I looked up at her and she started pointing. There was a buffalo just going in the water about to cross the river. And so I, I ran with my camera down there. I set up my tripod. I looked at the buffalo, I went to take a picture, and my battery died. And there I sat. No battery, no nothing. And all I could do was watch the buffalo go across the river. I got no photographs. So I have a backpack with all, that thing, all those things with you, you can take and run. I learned a lot from kind of a trip down memory lane, talking with my father about how he did this kind of work, and being able to go out and actually try to apply the things that he did. I learned a lot in this experience. There's wild animals all around you. They're in your yard right now, I promise you. Not a buffalo but at least a cute little rabbit like this one I saw in my front yard got some pictures of it. Of course, I saw Monty Python. It may attack. I could have been killed. Anyway, don't get killed. Get out there and photograph some wild animals. So keep those cameras rolling. Keep on clicking. Just a wee rabbit. I keep sounding like Harry Potter. What does Monty Python sound like? Go to thesliderlens.com to win a 150 to 600 millimeter Tamron lens. It's crazy long. That's a beast. That's a monster. It's huge. That thing is large. <laughs>